Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our colloquy colloquium on the Dignity for All Students Act. Uh, my name is Katie Allen, and I am the Training and Evaluation Specialist here at the Alberti Center for Bullying Abuse Prevention. I am pleased to welcome our distinguished guests who have so generously agreed to participate on this panel. And so we have with us today Mr. William Bowen, who is the assistant principal at Transit Middle School. He's been in Williamsville for approximately eight years, and he's at the tail end of his PhD uh, program and is almost ready to submit his dissertation. So we wish him good luck on that. Um, we also hope that Mr. John Starkey, who is the principal of Lafayette High School, will be with us very shortly. Um, and then we have Amy. Borowiak, and I got that right? Oh, thank you. Um, Amy has been an elementary school counselor in grades pre-K through eight for the last 21 years. Uh, she has spent all of her career in the Buffalo Public Schools. For the past 10 years, she has been the PBIS coach, and she's also currently part of the school leadership team, which is primarily focused on school culture and climate. And then we have Mr. David Hills, who is the principal of Waterfront Elementary School in the Buffalo Public Schools. And lastly, we have Patricia Balthasar, who is a school counselor at Cleveland Hill Middle School. Uh, she's been a school counselor for 20 years. She's worked in several schools in western New York um, and as well spent some time with the Chicago Public Schools. She's currently in her 13th year at, as the middle school counselor at Cleveland Hill. So um, I'd like to begin by doing a quick review of the DASA legislation, and then we have sent our panelists a series of questions, and we've pretty much assigned two people to answer each question. Um, certainly, if anyone on the panel wants to uh, chime in after they've offered their remarks, please feel free to do so. Um, and then we'll save hopefully 10 minutes at the end for questions. All right, does that work for everybody? Good. Okay, so the, the DASA legislation was signed by Governor um, Patterson in September of 2010, and it went into effect in schools in July of 2012. Um, and an amendment regarding cyberbullying was added to the le legislation and went into effect in the summer of 2013. The purpose of the DASA legislation is to foster civility in public schools and to prevent and prohibit conduct which is inconsistent with a school's educational mission. And so clearly our mission is to provide all students, regardless of actual or perceived race, color, weight, national origin, ethnic group, religion, religious practice, disability, sexual orientation, gender or sex with an education in an environment that is free from bullying, harassment, and intimidation. So essentially, the DASA legislation is an anti-discrimination law because, as we know, bullying, harassment, and intimidation create an unsafe environment for students that results in discrimination. The DASA law requires that each school will appoint a DASA coordinator whose responsibility it is to ensure that any reports of bullying, harassment, or intimidation be investigated, reported, and resolved. So the individuals we have here today have had extensive experience with investigating, reporting, and resolving issues of bullying and harassment. So again, we thank you for your participation. And I'm just curious, by show of hands, how many of you are DASA coordinators? Oh my, we have a great group. Okay, so um, I'd like to begin the first question, and this goes um, to Bill and David. And um, the question is, what do you do when a parent or a student insists that the child has been bullied or harassed and you cannot substantiate it with evidence? So, Bill, you'd like to go first, and then David? Testing? Turned on? Uh, he says good. Okay, good. <laughs> um, th this happens every once in a while. We try to be very thorough with um, inv DAS investigations, taking written statements. Uh, talking to witnesses, reviewing video footage uh, that's around the school if necessary. But every so often you might get a case that happened in an unsupervised area of the building. There were no witnesses. It's very difficult to confirm the facts of what actually happened. And then every once in a while you've probably dealt with this as well. You investigate something and there's really nothing of substance there. It's the student's perception that another student may be giving them dirty looks, talking about them behind their back, but you really can't find any substantial evidence. So 
There are a number of things that we do when this happens. One thing is we start with the parent and the student and ask them what they would like to see. What do you need to feel safe and supported at school? How can we better support you as either school counselors or school administrators or on a school level to make you feel safe here at school? Oftentimes, though, kids, especially when you're dealing with younger kids, 10, 11, 12 years old, that's generally the age level that we're working with at Transit, they don't know. They'll say, I, I don't really know. So it's really important to offer them some suggestions. You might want to ask the student, do you want me to let the teachers know about this? Um, look at their schedules. Uh, see if they are in the similar classes together, in the same lunchroom, same phys ed class. And the child might want you to give the teachers a heads up that there is something to, going on to keep a heads up on the situation. If the incident, the alleged incident, happened in an unsupervised area of the building, um, hallways, locker rooms, lunchroom, you might want to assign some additional supervision to those areas or the hot spots, we call them, and let the child know that we will be watching and that we have some adults there, and even introduce the child to the adults that will be providing the additional supervision, and let the child know that these are people that are aware that there's something going on and we would like you to go and report to these people if something happens. Also, coaching the students is really important as to what to say if something happens. If something happens in the hallway, if the child approaches you, says something, does something, do they know what to do? Oftentimes they don't when they're that young, so it's really important as a counselor to coach them as uh, what strategies they should be using. Um, telling them to stop, walking with a friend, reporting to the counselor or an adult close by if something happened. So really important to go over a strategy with the students or a plan. Um, it's really important to coordinate with your counselors and your teachers a plan to help the student feel safe and supported based on your suggestions, things that they would like you to follow through with and meet with the counselors and the teachers and make them aware that there was a problem just so they know to look out for things in the future. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hills. Um, a lot of that <clears throat> we also put in practice at Waterfront. And I think the most important thing, DASA is there because if a child feels unsafe at school, it will impact the, their learning and can lead to larger mental health issues. So it, it is an incident that we have to treat very seriously. And unfortunately, DASA has put us into a lot of these gray areas where uh, perception of an incident is different from those who are allegedly involved and the person who is allegedly a victim, um, understanding of, of what's going on in cyber environments also can be somewhat of a gray area. What's normal discourse in a cyber environment can be intimidating and harassing uh, perceived by, a, by the victim. So the most important thing, though, is when we do approach a, a DASA case, when we do approach an allegation, that we begin the documentation immediately. Um, that we start a record, that we start to collect evidence. Uh, if you don't do that, then you're, you're really going tacking into the wind later on. Um, and the first thing that ever, the child wants and the parent wants in that situation is not necessarily a dispute over what did this mean or, well, we can't prove this because it's on Facebook and we can't call it up. They, that is the last thing that needs to come into play. What goes into play is that this is very serious and that we are going to reassure the parent and the student that this will not happen again. Um, because the feeling of being unsafe can lead to further allegations. A child who feels unsafe will, will operate in a way that maybe they will perceive slights or maybe the harassing behavior will continue. So it, it's very important to, we always say, um, look, we have a program that we do in this case. This is, we have a system that will address the issue but will not single your child out. Um, because the last thing a child wants, or a parent wants, they come to me and they say, look, this has been going on for two weeks. We haven't said anything. And the reason they haven't said anything is because they are worried about retaliation. So to establish a system that assures the parent, investigates fully the charges, and then makes sure that there's a sense of security and safety restored. Um, sometimes this takes the form of practicing with a parent and child how to interact on Facebook and how to capture evidence on Facebook. 
Sometimes this consists of forming a small group with, with, the, with the student to establish some pro-social skills. Sometimes it consists of reestablishing some supervision procedures. Sometimes it consists of doing whole class training um, when we notice that there may be some lapses in the culture. Um, so there's a variety of responses, but you want to make sure that every response you do, um, you document. Uh, that, that at the end you can say, look, this is where we went. And that there's frequent communication with the student and the parent who made the allegation. And sometimes uh, by creating a record, it does become clear that something that wasn't substantiable very early on in the process, you start to see the pattern. Then you can start to move to remedy uh, and resolve the issue with all students involved. Um, so, but first and foremost, that feeling of insecurity in school is devastating. And that's the, once the allegation comes forth, it's forward, it's critical to resolve that feeling of insecurity. Uh, there are very few students that are just paranoid. Um, they, there's usually something that they're experiencing, whether it's externalizing something internal or whether it's a very real um, experience that just cannot be substantiated. Uh, and again, and I love what, what Bill said, establishing communication partners. Usually I'll say, who's, who's the one person you feel most comfortable talking to? And we'll, we'll set up a routine for that person and then I'll have, let that person know, look, this is what we're looking for. They're going to check in with you. Um, very often, one of the guidance counselors will also be on on point to do some supervision with the student, check on their well-being, um, do a temperature check, and most of the times that resolves the issue. And we're able to restore the student to a full sense of security, deal with any allegation eventually that comes out, and fully document everything we've done. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, does anyone else want to add to anything that was already said? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you all are aware that the term bullying is very commonplace now. It's very much overused. Media has picked up on it, and it seems like everything is bullying. Where we all know, as professionals in schools, everything is not always bullying. So. Sometimes it takes a lot of education for the students and the parents on what truly is bullying versus what is just being mean, what is being rude, what's a conflict. So sometimes when parents call up say, my kid's being bullied and this has been going on for weeks and weeks, well, let's, let's take a look at what exactly happened in this scenario and is this truly a bullying incident. It doesn't mean that we handle it any differently. Um, there's always an investigation. We're always... Um, going to be talking to students and trying to resolve it. But um, I always hesitate when a parent or student comes down and says, I'm being bullied. Well, let's take another look. What's really going on? Is this truly a bullying, DASA bullying incident? And then you, you, know, you find your interventions and supports accordingly. OK. Thank you very much, Patty. All right, our next question is for Amy and Patty. Um, and this question is, how do you deal with situations where both students have engaged in harassment, but you suspect that one student was the instigator and the other student was primarily trying to get it to stop, not necessarily get even? And this could be harassment, bullying, some sort of aggressive behavior, um, and you're not sure if, um, you know, one, ch one student was just trying to protect him or herself. Want to go first? Amy? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, that's a very good question. I treat both students as they, if they were the um, bully and the victim. Um, uh, many times, our kids who are bullying are also victims. So I, I te treat them separate. I take them separately. I talk to them each individually. Um, I, we expect our teachers to explicitly teach things. I think we need to explicitly teach what is bullying, what is harassment, what to do when you are harassed. So there is no gray area. This is what you do when someone says this to you. This is who you go to. This person's available at this time. So be very specific about it. Um, and also be very very upfront and explicit about the consequences of bullying in school. 
if this continues, this is what's going to happen. So everything's on the table. Um, if it's more of a conflict situation, I would do a conflict resolution with both students, but the longer I do this, the more I'm understanding that um, bullying is not about a relationship with another person. It's about um, taking personal responsibility for your own actions. So when we have bullying situations, that's where I tend to go with the students. Um, I will do a contract with them. What are you going to do to make this stop? Um, you know, each person has to take responsibility for not posting something, not saying something, walking away, telling somebody. Um, and both students I would link with an adult who is a caring adult, someone they can go to if they are unsure about what they're doing is a bullying behavior or um, if they feel like somebody is bullying them. And I'll talk more about the culture of the school probably in another question. But um, also working with parents and guardians in the elementary school, that's what I can basically s speak to. It is the most important thing. Um, getting parents to work as your team members in this is makes things way easier for everybody. Um, and also, when I do counseling with the students, I also report back to the administration about the steps I have taken, very, very detailed. I've done a contract with the students, and this is what they said they will do. So if it reaches another level, it's kind of gone beyond the counseling part of it, and now it has to go on to the consequences part of it. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, ditto to a lot of what Amy said. Um, when you have a bullying incident um, where the bullier and then the victim, um, the victim is retaliating, um, I, I use those as an opportunity, a counseling opportunity for each of those students. Um, kudos to the target for trying to respond, trying to protect him or herself, um, defend herself against the bully but probably was choosing the wrong choices um, in how he or she was dealing with that because responding back with harassment, responding back with threats obviously is not productive. It's not the way to handle a situation. So ditto to what Amy said is that we use this as a counseling opportunity, a teaching opportunity. Here are the steps. If this should happen again, um, here's what you need to do. And even though I'm sure we all do this in schools, we educate the kids in the heat of the moment, emotions run high. You forget what those steps are. And we're talking about children, too. So um, it's hard to remember exactly what to do in the heat of the moment. But, um, you know, as you're sitting in my office, you know, separately, let's press the rewind, rewind button and figure out what should you have done differently. So this would have not um, turned out to be... Um, the, the, you know, the problem where you're both now maybe in trouble or have consequences for harassing behavior. So just using this, obviously, as a counseling opportunity and um, helping them figure out the proper choices to make if this should happen again. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? No? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, now we're going to switch into the topic of interventions. And the first question is for Mr. John Starkey. Welcome. And to Amy. And the question is, what interventions are the most successful in resolving harassment and bullying, and how do you decide what interventions to use in response to allegations? So, Amy. Mr. Starkey, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for having me today. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Sorry I was late. I had issue at school related to the topic, so <laughs> <laughs> not, not prearranged, but um, I think really for us at Lafayette uh, International Community High School, because we're starting a new school with a new ninth grade, we have this unique opportunity to establish a new culture, and one of our uh, main goals is creating a positive uh, climate or a positive environment. So trying to be as proactive as possible, not being reactive, I think is really key in resolving harassment and bullying. So what we did is we took the uh, Buffalo Code of Conduct, which is quite comprehensive, um, but depending on where you go, it may not be implemented in its complete fidelity because it's quite dense and every climate, every environment is different depending on the situation and factors involved. What we did is we took that, we put it in front of the students in advisory classes that we have every morning from 9 to 940, which is kind of a, a warm-up class. It's a place where you can talk about 
de-escalation, conflict resolution, uh, role plays, giving professional development to the teachers on, okay, this week let's focus on, you know, what about this idea of I have to defend myself? Because oftentimes when there's a conflict, the kid that got punched or pushed, when he punches back and he knocks out the other kid, then he says, I was just defending myself. But like my, my colleague here on the panel said just now, you know, when you're reflecting on that, what could you have done differently? What steps could you have taken so that it wouldn't have ended up in this violent outcome? So with that uh, code of conduct, the kids basically looked at it and with the teachers helping them in this advisory class, broke it down into their own words, into layman's terms, into their own language, literally their own language, since we're 100% English language le learners at the school. Um, we did it in their native language and in English, and then we s went and got their version of it um, translated into the nine top languages in the school, and we made these big posters, and we called it the village rules. So we, we changed it from code of conduct, which kind of sounds a little punitive, to village rules, since all of them are coming from countries where they were really raised by a village, not just like the traditional nuclear family, like we might be more used to here in the US. And then having it in their languages and prominently displayed across the school really gave them a sense of ownership over the code of conduct. And things like, um, you know, first in a, in a quiet voice, let the person know that you don't want to um, be bothered or that, you know, you can ignore them. Who are the key people you can go to? Who's the social worker? Who's the, um, the uh, guidance counselor, administration? But also having key people and having kids aware of who those key people are that speak their languages. So it might be an aide. It might be you know, a security guard that we've vetted into this kind of restorative practice. And then we had kind of a, uh, a rite of passage, if you will, where we had these um, drumming groups that we have in the auditorium playing, and then we asked everybody to come up and si sign the, these village rules. And so the idea is really to make the rules of the school theirs so that if and when they do step out of line, we can say, you sign that village rules document. You know, right here it says that when you threw your iPad down because you were upset because your, you know, um, stepfather slapped your mother before you came to school today and you're angry, but you took that iPad and you threw it down on the ground and that's destruction of school property. There's a consequence for that and you're going to have to serve that consequence. However, let's talk about the root of the problem. Do you know that we have a free legal clinic here on Mondays and your mother can come to get help, you know, to maybe get out of this domestic relationship because all of these um, destructive behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, bullying behaviors have a root. So to try and tackle that and be proactive and then in the school to really have the students understand what the um, expectations are and what the support is, I think is a, a, a good set of kind of guidelines to look at interventions. Okay, thank you. Um, Amy, do you want to address the interventions that are most successful and how do you decide what intervention to use? Um, along with what Mr. Starkey said, uh, the culture of this school is huge on addressing uh, bullying issues and harassment. If you think you're going to start at fourth grade when the actual stuff comes out and you're going to address it, that's too late. It has to start in pre-K, in kindergarten. Um, we've worked really hard to create a culture where students feel connected to adults. Um, there's a, we, uh, we went through a thing where kids didn't want to ask for help. They thought it was snitching or telling. Um, over the years, we've created an environment where that's okay. That's, it's safe to tell an adult what's going on with you. And that's been a big shift. And when we have new kids come into Waterfront, we have to tell them, oh, don't worry about telling on someone because they'll tell on you in a minute. You know, <laughs> that's what we do here. <laughs> We're a bunch of tellers. But um, we feel that that really, um, that really opens communication and helps us to work with them where they're at. Um, also creating a culture where teachers and other adults model respect um, to one another and the students. Sometimes we work with our teachers around that. Um, and also to have enough appropriate supports in place to not only work with students who are having trouble, but to follow up. I know in my role, sometimes I can, I can do the intervention, but then following up is, is a little harder. So that's something we're all 
um, working on. Also, like I said before, involving parents and families is, is huge. Um, and I'm big on PBIS, I don't positive behavior intervention supports. Um, and our school is, and I really believe in teaching, modeling, and rewarding appropriate um, social behavior um, and respectful behavior. And that starts when they're really little and kind of building that culture. Um, individual instances of bullying, you kind of have to take each one as it comes and use your professional judgment on, and, and consult with your colleagues about the best way to handle each one. But um, in general, um, just if you have any input in creating the culture in your school, which we all kind of do, um, I think that's where the meat and potatoes is. I think that's where you can make the most impact. Um, and the other thing is also the administration has to be consistent in following through with consequences. <laughs> um, if the kids think they're going to get away with something, they'll get away with it. That's the bottom line. Um, but it's, I, with, I think with bullying, it's not about just teaching and it's not about just punishing. It has to be both everything together. You're not going to solve the problem if you're not doing both things. Okay, thank you. Yes, you want to add, add something, David? Yeah. Um, around the election, we had some issues where um, students start, we, we're 30% English language learners. We're um, probably one of the most diverse schools in the city of Buffalo, uh, about 20% white, about 48% uh, or 46% black, but half of that is first generation refugee and, and half is multi-generational. Um, Hispanic population, Arab population, Asian population. So it, it um, there there were some instances of students expressing confusion or using things they heard in the media in a way that other students felt harassed. And we kind of had to, I had to have a couple times where I just went into classes and said, "Look, we're waterfront. This is the strength of who we are. If you're going to talk like this, you're destroying you're destroying us." and you're ruining what this can do for your future. Um, that's pretty rare that we do those whole group addresses, but sometimes you, you realize the culture's just getting a little off and you have to do something to reset it. Um, and so I had a 20 minute talk with a class where this was coming up about who we are as a school and what that means and why we wouldn't ever say this to each other. Um, but sometimes things just start to fire a little bit. And one kid plays off of another kid. And you have to use various strategies. Something that Ms. Broyak uses that she didn't mention is a lot of small groups. Small groups to work on social skills. Uh, we have tons and tons of them running. OK, anyone else? All right, thank you. All right, the second question on interventions has to do with cyberbullying. And this question is for Bill and John. How do you manage or respond to instances of bullying or harassment in cyberspace? Obviously, cell phones, social media, and so forth. Um, Bill, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, very important, the middle school level, for a number of reasons. One, this, the middle school level is really when many students, kids, receive phones for the first time. Um, at our school, um, at the middle schools in Williamsville, students are all also uh, supplied with a school-issued Chromebook or iPad, all of the students. So the education component is critical. Um, teaching students how to be a digital citizen, incorporating that into the instruction, and how it connects with the code of conduct. So Amy mentioned it's very important to be explicit. Um, with your expectations, John talked about the code of conduct. It's very important that you are explicit with the students about your expectations in regards to cyberbullying. You can't just assume that students know that if it happens off of school that they're not school property, they're not going to be held accountable. Um, the students need to know and understand that if they post something online, even if it happens at home, if it's unkind towards another student, the school will be following up. Maybe there's not a connection to the school. So that's one thing that we look at. Was there a disruption? Is there a connection to the school? But it is DASA related if a student feels unsafe or threatened coming into the building because of something that happened online at home. So many, most of them actually are DASA related. And we are very explicit with the students that if they post something online, 
even if it happens at home, if it's not kind, if it's about another student, we say expect that we will call you down if the school finds out about it. And at minimum, we will call your parents. That's the minimum. And we're very clear with the students and we regularly reinforce. So it's really important just to be explicit and clear with the school expectations in regards to that. We also educate students on what to do if they're a victim of cyberbullying. So many students do not know what to do if it happened to them for the first time. So we tell them, take a screenshot, show your parents, bring it into the school, we will help you. Um, don't respond, don't add to the problem by commenting on things that kids may be posted on your social media account or texted you. Just simply take a screenshot, bring it in. So it's really important to educate the students in addition as to what to do if they're a victim. Um, really important to talk with your school counselors on a follow-up plan. So our school counselors have actually developed a mini lesson on digital citizenship for individuals who are aggressors in cyberbullying cases, and also a follow-up plan with the victims. So increase the frequency of check-ins with the school counselor is really important for the victims, but also a digital citizenship individualized lesson is one of the components that we've used to follow up with the aggressors in cyberbullying cases. Yes, social networking is kind of the bane of my existence because it is something that exacerbates all of the issues between kids that have already exist, always existed, but now it's just even worse because of Facebook and Snapchat and screenshot and you got you almost have to have somebody on staff that's aware of all the different social networks so that they can keep you up on the technology, um, and then students as well. So I I think. This would go beyond cyberbullying, but I think as administrators or uh, usually it's an administrator and director of security, what I've found helpful is to always have a couple moles. So you have a couple kids that are you know, active on social networking and maybe you cut a little deal with them. Maybe they got into trouble for something. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it a little easy on you, um, but you know, you got to help me out. So I need to know when you're on Facebook for you to come to me and let me know what's, what's going to go down. And um, we've been able to stop some pretty significant um, potential, uh, you know, acts of violence or harassment by having somebody on the inside, a kid that will come to us and say, you know, I've been seeing a lot about, you know, this group is saying they might have a gang initiation or this group is, you know, this group of girls is saying to this group of girls, you know, they're going to get them after school. You also have to have somebody that can decipher the language that they're using because even if it's in English, it's almost another language, the, the types of words that they're using. And then if it's in another language, it's very difficult also. Even in Spanish, we have a lot of bilingual teachers, counselors, but when we're reading it, we're like, wait, we need somebody to kind of... Um, change it from colloquial, you know, kind of street language into something that we can understand so we can understand what's going on. Um, another important part of the cyberbullying is, and I, and I would say again, it's something that could be addressed with non-cyberbullying as well. When we're doing the investigation, when the issues have been brought to us, to make sure you separate all the kids. Because if you have a couple kids together, then they can kind of play off of each other's stories. But when you have kids in different rooms and then you're asking, okay, tell me about how did this start, then you can kind of piece it together because, of course, people are going to lie to try and get themselves out of trouble and they're going to um, maybe have a different perspective on the story as well. So you can kind of bring it back together. In terms of phones, we, um, we require that all students submit their phone upon arrival and we got parents to sign off on that. If the student needs to call home, they can come to the office and call home. So just by students not having a phone, it minimalizes some of those things in school. And then um, we have worked with parole officers and um, different people involved in the criminal justice system that can also get subpoenas to get access to um, social networking if it's an incident that um, might have um, ended up in a violent act or a rape or something like that, then we would be able, um, at times, we've been able to work with the police um, or other authorities to get access to that because it's amazing um, how ignorant some people are in posting as much as they do on social networking. You can really get a tremendous amount of um, information from it. But that's all in, in addition to training and education because the overwhelming majority of students will be responsible with it. They just need that explicit instruction on these are the expectations of what you should do to be a good digital citizen. 
I'm going to follow up with a question. What, how do you involve parents in the process if it involves social media and electronic communication? And you're shaking your head, but I'm happy to have anyone chime in on, on that issue. You want to start, Bill? Do you do anything with parents? Many times the parents don't know what to do. If it's their first uh, child that's gone through the school, it's their first phone. Um, part of it is educating the parents on what to do and educating the parents on what it means to be a digital citizen. Um, teaching the parents about various types of social media, how to find it, how to monitor, um, how to go through the phones, look through records. So it's really important to include parents and don't just assume that they know all the ins and outs of a phone and social media. Um, it's really important to educate the parents on the different types of social media that, that kids are using. Um, you know, we, when we find out that students are on Instagram or Facebook in fifth grade, sixth grade, we'll work, we just tell the parents we don't recommend it, we don't think it's a good idea. Um, you know, what they choose to do in their home, it's, it's up to them. But it's really important um, to educate the parents and also provide recommendations. Um, you know, recommendations for consequences at home, such as limiting the access of the phone. Um, keeping the phone in the parent's bedroom at night, um, monitoring, uh, monitoring the computer, looking through the web history. So you can't just assume that the parents know. It's really important to be explicit and educate the parents as well. Anybody else have any ideas around that question? Uh, just for our parents, um, particularly our refugee parents, it's sometimes difficult because they might have limited knowledge of computers. And so some of the students pick up on that, and then that's where they can have a lot of different kinds of discourse and different kinds of activities. Um, I had one student who was involved in some issues in New York City, and uh, the mother was so worried about him that she put the, the only computer, the laptop that they had, in the middle of the living room, and Grandma had to sit next to him when he was on it. And then Grandma would yell at him if she saw faces. So faces meant it was Facebook. So I'm sure he found I'm sure he found a way around that, but you know, letting the family know and as much as we can when we have you know different types of workshops for the parents, we have a community school. So Tuesday and Thursday night we have workshops, ESL classes, and things like that for the parents. But just to work that in there, that they should be aware that these kinds of things are happening on the internet, and it can be a very dangerous place too, especially for the young um, girls that go on these um, types of social networking sites and then there's people that might be posing as a younger person but it could be an older person or people that are younger but have bad intentions. Um, that has led to some very serious um, incidents um, mm -hmm. in my career. So I, I think that um, parents being aware of how potentially, it danger potentially dangerous it is, mm -hmm. is really important. And then again, anytime when we're working with the parents to make sure it's somebody that speaks their language that is working with us, like the counselor and an interpreter, um, so that they're getting the information in their native language. Otherwise, if you're saying it in, in English and they're just nodding their head, like, yes, they're probably not getting what you're talking to them about. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, continuing on the question of uh, parents, um, this is for David and Patty. What advice do you have for working with parents of students involved in intimidation, harassment, bullying, both as aggressors and targets? And um, a lot of the work we have to do is with the student, but it's critical that the component with the parent take place. Uh, it starts with, for both the victim and the aggressor's parent, to really have a, a strong conversation that you're almost assessing what is going on in that family? What is going on with that parent? Uh, what is going on with the child? Uh, because really, once you've kind of investigated the issue, there are always kind of spider trails that, that lead off uh, if there's an un undiagnosed mental health issue. So we'll try and figure that out. And fortunately, we have an on-site mental health clinic at, for a day and a half uh, every week. So we can start, sort of head that way. We also have a say yes facilitator on site so we can see if there's some, the family needs extra support. Um, it really, to really interview through the parents and find out what's going on because for many of our parents, um, they feel helpless to help their child deal with what's going on emotionally or socially, whether it's alleged or, or real. Uh, they also feel somewhat under-resourced in managing their household and parenting completely. So 
to really assess where are they at, where can we provide supports. And for that parent to realize for both parents, their, their word of mouth is going to be incredibly powerful. So if they, start, if they leave this interaction and this experience and say, my kid got bullied and, didn't do, and the school didn't do anything, they didn't resolve the situation, that world, word will spread like, water, uh, like wildfire. And if you don't resolve it, then you get more and more allegations. If there's a sense between parents that bullying is not reacted to, that parent will tell another parent. The parent will come in and say, my kid's being bullied too. So really, you, you're addressing that parent to completely convince them that this situation is deal, dealt with. Um, I always kind of make a note and call back in a week to say, just how are we doing? Where are we at on this? What has been done in the plan we put in place? What needs to be done? Because it's really capturing that parent, resolving whatever issues, and, and beginning some kind of treatment plan if there is anything in place, providing supports for the household, um, and then convincing them a problem we dealt with. If it's a situation where their child is the aggressor, to really, once, the, once it's been clear the evidence for what's going on, and explain to them that this is, you know, New York State says, we cannot have this in our schools. This will be dealt with to the fullest extent of my power. And to really let them know that if this situation isn't resolved, it is going to be dealt with. And for most parents, if they see that there's no gap for this, they will act to make sure their, their child gets in line and particularly if we put the supports in place. But again, there's usually something else going on. And behind almost every bullying report, somewhere in the weeds, there's a larger story. And that larger story, whatever it is, is the one that has to be dealt with. Um, and if it's just a straight up incident of bullying, that's, that's one of the easiest things to deal with. But if there are mental health issues, if there are issues of a uh, dysfunctional home that's really leading to either the victim feeling um, in danger or the perpetrator maybe being overly aggressive, th those underlying issues have to be resolved uh, or you're going to have a repeat of the same problem. So really taking the time to assess with the parent um, and convince them and build a plan with them. Thank you. No parent wants their kid to come home from school and say, Mom, I'm Mom, Dad, I'm being bullied. And then tears and then emotions, and that's, that's a, a very, very difficult thing for your child to have to go through. So a parent needs to just listen to their kid and find out what's being done, what's happening, and then call up the school and report that. But um, parents need to be educated also that not everything is bullying, like I mentioned before. Um, we all know that kids are emotional in school, and not all kids are the nicest kids. Um, there are a lot of mean things that happen. The kids are, they have bad manners. They um, have, they, they'll give a dirty look, and that's not bullying. That's just, you know, really just poor manners. So parents need sometimes just reassurance that we will look into every situation and determine what's going on, and we will resolve it. But not everything is a true bullying incident. And what was, the, what was their child's role in that as well? Um, we know sometimes kids can come home, if their feelings are hurt, they might exaggerate a situation. Um, they might skew it. They might think that they're going to get in trouble for something, so they're going to blame it on the other kid. So there's, there can be a lot of components to what a parent considers a bullying incident. Um, I always appreciate when the parents call up, but I let them know that we, you know, let us do our job, let us investigate um, before they just start demanding, well, what are you going to do? Is this kid going to get suspended? And, you know, you don't do anything at that school. Okay, parent, you know, relax. We will, we will handle it, and we will make sure that it's investigated thoroughly, and we will come up with the best um, consequences for what's going on. And parents just need a little patience for let, to let us do our job. Um, sometimes they need a little bit of education as well. And, um, but the, the communication, no matter what level of an incident this is, keeping that parent informed. Say, okay, give us a day to investigate. We'll get back to you tomorrow morning, or we'll get back to you within a certain amount of time, and then make sure that you do follow through on that. Um, and let them know every step of the way that we um, definitely 
care about your kid. You don't want anything to happen, you know, bad to your child. And we'll do everything in our power to make sure that the situation is going to be resolved. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to um, add anything to that? Okay, so um, the last set of questions have to do with the roles of administrators, teachers, social workers, school psychologists, and all of our professional staff. And this question, I actually have three people uh, for this one. It's Bill, John, and Amy. Um, and so the questions are, what do, role does the administrator play in the DASA investigations and or follow-up? What role does the school counselor play? And what is the classroom teacher's role and responsibility related to DASA? So, um, Bill, John, who would like to start, go first with that? Um, for us, this has been critical at our school. We, um, we have 1,000 kids, so it's one of the larger middle schools in the area. We have four counselors, one social worker, and one psychologist. Um, I actually meet with that group every single day at the beginning of the day, first thing. And uh, many of my colleagues say, wow, that's a lot of time to commit every single day of the week. But I've actually found that that's been a major time saver because before we had that system in place, when we would receive a DASA complaint, a bullying allegation, harassment, or any other issue that went on during the day, uh, we were interrupting each other. We were constantly trying to find each other. It was a very inefficient system. So it's really important to establish communication systems between the administrator and the counselors. That morning meeting is our time to share anything that came up throughout the day, uh, parent phone calls, student complaints, allegations. Um, and it's really important periodically to clarify the roles and responsibilities. So. It's very busy with a 1,000 students. Sometimes the roles can become a bit gray and unclear. And we don't want students to think of the school counselor as someone who reinforces negatively, someone who investigates, someone who assigns consequences. The counselor's role is really to support the child. The administrator's role is to conduct the investigation, to assign the consequences, to coordinate a follow-up plan. So we really try to be clear about the roles and responsibilities, and the counselor's role is really to support not only the victim, but also the aggressor might need some support because we might discover that there are certain things going on with the aggressor at home, with other students, maybe they're reacting, maybe there's some depression or thoughts of suicide. So we also have the counselors follow up with the aggressor. Those really high level cases, maybe there are family situations, divorce, something going on with the aggressors in the aggressor's household or the victim's household, then we will bring the social worker and we're really fortunate to have a full-time social worker. Um, so it's really important to not only clarify the roles, but also establish those communication systems for regular and frequent communication between the counselors and the, the administrator. That's great. It's good to be on the panel because I'm learning new things to bring back to the school so or being reminded of things. Um, I would agree with my colleague here that the counselor, um, we try and make her in our school kind of the good cop. And then if it gets to the point where I have to get involved in terms of a DASA allegation, um, then I'm kind of the heavy hand. But that might be different depending on the um, you know, administrative setup of the school. You might have an assistant principal that plays that role or some other person um, in the school. But I really would get involved um, in the investigation to kind of um, try and get to the root issue and then to make sure we're clear on what the different roles are for um, steps moving forward. And the follow-up really is crucial, um, as David had mentioned earlier, to document. Because what you don't want happening is, you know, you say, okay, it's, you know, this isn't that big of a thing, you know, give them a little bit of a slap on the wrist, and then they go back to class, and then it gets worse, and then it comes back, well, why didn't you document this? What was the consequence of this? Um, I would say also to make sure whatever uh, whatever outcomes there are, whatever consequences there are, to make sure that that's set up in a very um, purposeful way. You don't want to have the mom that's justifying that her kid isn't bullied, it's the other kid, in the same room with 
the mom who said, your kid is bullying my kid, and they're both very angry, and they're coming together, and you just put the counselor in there with the two of them. You know, you, you want to make sure, spacing-wise, if they go at each other, they, there's somebody in between so they wouldn't be able to get at each other. Like, little things like that. I try as an administrator to make sure my team is trained so that we're really aware of safety um, when it comes time to, to um, discussing what the uh, consequences are or the restorative kind of welcome back to the village type of um, type of uh, event. We want to be really purposeful about that. Um, in terms of the classroom teacher's role and responsibility, I think from an administrative point of view, something that probably has frustrated some administrators, including myself over the years, is when something's been brewing and you haven't heard anything about it. And then it's the straw that breaks the camel's back and some big thing blows up and then the kids are saying, well, this was happening in the classroom. You know, they were laughing at me for weeks and you didn't hear about it. So really just professional development and being explicit with your expectations to the staff that when you hear something or see something, say something. Because if we're aware of it, then we can be proactive. If you just don't say anything about it and, again, just kind of let it go, then it's going to um, turn into something worse. And I think also with the classroom teacher's role, um, thinking about how to work into the curriculum, depending on what the class is, opportunities for students to explore issues related to DASA and related to bullying and other things. So a, a, a do now when you walk into the classroom for a journal prompt in global studies where it's, you know, talk about a time that you saw something but you didn't do anything, um, but you knew it was wrong. You know, a lot can come out in those journal prompts or through debates in class or through different types of um, academic opportunities that can inform us of what's going on in the school or what's going on in a kid's life. Okay, thank you. Amy? Um, I think the counselor's responsibility is really to educate about harassment, about bullying, but as Patty said too, we start in kindergarten and we start teaching about how to ignore, how to, you know, how to walk away. All those little things that can prevent a bullying situation from coming down the line. How to deal with things that aren't bullying. Um, so a lot of it is education. Um, and also to support the bullies, the bystanders, the victims, um, be that person. The other thing about the groups that Mr. Hills talked about is when you have a group of kindergartners or first graders, you're building a relationship for them and you're with them for nine years in our case. So they become, you know, you build trust with them. So they will come and talk to you about things. They will ask questions. Um, and that's a nice little um, benefit, I think, that we have being with them for nine years. Um, the administrator's responsibility, I still think, is to educate um, families. It seems that in our situation, when the families are brought in, most of the time they'll meet with the administrator, sometimes we'll be there. So it is an opportunity for them to educate, um, reinforce the district and school's policies, um, provide consequences. Um, and also, the administrators, if they build a relationship with the kids and the kids know that they can come to them, I think that's, that's huge. Um, we had a young girl the other day say, I only want to talk to Mr. Hills. He's the only one I'll talk to. And I was like, oh. Can you see her? And he You're said, supposed to work around that. <laughs> and he said, "Yes, bring her in." You know, so um, having when ki when kids feel like they can go to their administrator, and that their administrator is going to listen to them and help them, that that's priceless. Um, and and engaging parents um, and families, we all have to do that. Um, it's it, it takes a village <laughs> to um, it takes us all to really work together. Um, but those are the the big difference is the teachers, a lot of times if I know something's going on, I will email the teachers, hey, could you just, could you just keep your eye out for this? Because most of the time it's not happening in the classroom. It'll happen at lunch, at the lockers, in the locker room at, at phys ed. So, but they hear what's going on when they come back. So I'll be like, can you just keep an eye on this and let me know if there's anything? So, and the teachers, that I've come in contact with have been excellent in pulling kids aside and saying, hey, this isn't how our classroom operates. You know, this isn't going to be tolerated in our classroom. And really being a really big help, because they're the ones on the front lines who are dealing with it all, all day and every day. So. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Well, we have exactly 10 minutes left, so I'd like to um, open the floor up for all of your questions, and we can get those microphones turned on. Remember that all the movement now in front of you will get picked up on those microphones. So um, would anyone like to ask the panel any questions? I, I'm overly impressed with how um, knowledgeable they are. So would anyone like to begin? Yes. So I actually have a comment question. I actually interned at Waterfront with a school social worker. And um, that's funny you mentioned that because that was one of the first things I thought was really strange that I was counseling a kid who was in trouble and he said, I just want to talk to Mr. Hills. And I was like, <laughs> that's the <a> principal. <laughs> but um, being there, I realized the importance of school climate because I'm not, I've honestly never been in a school that was so welcoming and even I think when I was there, everybody would wait outside at the bus for like all the kids to come in. That's the only school I've seen that happen. But I um, also noticed that you implement PBIS really well and all the teachers um, <coughs> do it and are involved. So I guess I was just wondering if there's any tips you have for getting like teacher buy-in and implementing a successful school-wide intervention. Um, one great way to get teacher buy-in is to have the school go really crazy for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the best way because then you can come and say let's do this and no um, I think you know, there is a strong tie-in for PBIS and DASA uh, response because one DASA complaints are going to happen during unstructured times those unstructured times in common areas the hallway the locker room the cafeteria getting off the bus and PBIS looks at school-wide data to target and explicitly tr teach appropriate behavior in those unstructured areas. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where we, we looked at, you know, our big areas have been the hallway and the cafeteria and that we worked really hard on. Um, so PBIS eliminates a lot of the unstructured times where you can start to have DASA issues. Um, then it also creates a culture of positive responses, positive rewards, um, which counters the inclination to act <coughs> negatively and aggressively. So, um, since this isn't a PBIS implementation, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get too much into it. But really, if you want to resolve DASA complaints, one of the best ways to do it is to establish a PBIS school-wide culture of structure and positive responses. <coughs> yes. Um, we had a question about sharing information. We had a very aggressive parent who wanted tons and tons of paperwork. Have you guys had experience with that as far as data collection for a parent request? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends what kind of information. Like they... They wanted like all the reports, all the yeah. investigation materials, probably to sue us. So right, I just right. don't know like what people have done or what yeah. response people There's have had. Some gray areas in there. It depends, I think, on the level of infraction. Like if we levy a formal suspension against a student for, let's say, a fight or bringing a weapon to school, then that information that we document all gets forwarded to the suspension hearing officer at City Hall. And then they're responsible for giving the copies to the parents. This would be the victim's parents. Oh, the victim's parents? Well, yeah, in that case, we, we would provide them kind of with a summary of our report, but we wouldn't be able to put any information about who the aggressor was in the report. So we've been giving them copies of, so this is our write-up of kind of what happened, but we kind of have the A write-up, which is kind of the general idea and then the B write-up, which is what we have to document, which is all of the things that we have to put, like the platform in Buffalo Schools is infinite campus. Yeah, but it, so, you know, on that, you have to have who, who the victim was, who the aggressor was, what the outcome of the situation was, but we're not printing out that and giving it to, you know, the parents of the victim. And I think listening to them and, and doing the things that, you know, our colleagues here on the panel had talked about, informing them, making them feel rest assured, and then kind of, ducking that question of like, well, I want all of this documented with the aggressor's name. I want to meet the mother of this kid. You know, we have to kind of gently steer them away from that because we, we just can't do that. Um, I have a clear discussion with the, that individual about how my sharing any of the information from the investigation would be a violation of the other student's verbal rights and any student involved, any student we interviewed, and that would victimize all those other students. And the last thing I'm going to do is turn uh, an attempt to stop your child from being victimized into victimizing others. 
um, they do ask. I share the boilerplate procedures. Um, I share what our standard operating is, and that's what they get. Um, and then if that's not satisfying them, you know, I've had parents say to me, you have that folder there. I want everything in that folder. I say, and I want a subpoena. Uh, you're not, you're, it's just not going to happen. I'm not going to expose um, other children to violation and harm. And But the if the conversation's there, we're kind of in trouble already, which is why I try and, as much as I can at the front end, establish a positive relationship and, po and trust. Um, because obviously if you're getting those kinds of requests, there's a lack of trust there. Whether it's an overly aggressive and empowered parent or a parent that uh, is just acting out of a sense of self-preservation and protection, sometimes it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, yes. If we found if, if your follow-up plan, which I'm sure it is, is comprehensive, there's a lot that you can tell the parent and that usually resolve the, resolves the issue. Think of how much you can tell the parent of the victim of your response. You, may, you can let them know you inform the teachers. The teachers are going to keep a close eye on things. You walk down to the cafeteria, you told the lunch monitors. Um, you are going to increase the frequency of your son or daughter's check-in with the school counselor until we're confident that the issue has been resolved. We also have a follow-up plan with the aggressor. I'm not, I can't share with you the details, but we have a long-term follow-up plan. And we called their parents, and they were supportive of our efforts. Um, that's really important. There's a lot that you can say short of the consequence and the documentation. Um, but, you know, if your follow-up plan is pretty comprehensive in nature, that usually will resolve the issue. Thank you. Anyone else want to add, uh, respond to either of, the, either of those questions about how to get teachers on board, um, unless there's something else that someone would like to ask? There was a question at the, uh, or the last panel question about teachers. I think our best um, leads on preventing actual bullying have come from teachers. It really is that they're, they're the ones that really see what's, what's happening. So uh, establishing a real clear culture with teachers where they can clearly share information. But the number of times a teacher comes to me and says, you know, I think this, this child's getting bullied. And, and usually that leads us in a good direction to resolve the problem. I agree with that. I think that's so important is um, regularly reminding teachers and reinforcing teachers what active supervision looks like, not only in their classroom, but all of our teachers have a supervisory duty, so it's either bus duty, hall duty, um, lunchroom duty, some are in the locker room, but it's really important to be clear about what active supervision looks like. We actually have that as the first item of every safety committee meeting because for us, active supervision plays such a critical role in safety, and safety is connected with DASA. So it's really important to establish those communication procedure, supervision procedures in your school and regularly reinforce what that looks like. Okay, yes. Could you give me an example of um, <clears throat> the level of consequences of a, a repeat offender? So there's a uh, bullying situation and you intervene, you talk to the parents. What, how does that process end if the student doesn't stop? Well, depending on the level of bullying, right? If in high school, so what we would move towards if we see that if the allegation and the investigation that we conducted showed unequivocally that there was a case of bullying, let's say, um, sexual harassment against a young lady starts on Facebook, starts with comments in the school, slap on the behind or something like that, um, intimidation, you know, then we're going to go to the tier three consequence with that and we're going to um, issue a formal um, suspension hearing. So then the student um, starts off with a five day suspension from school and then there's a hearing at City Hall where the, uh, a hearing officer looks at all of the documentation um, the aggressor or the bully in this case would um, go with their parents to City Hall. I would usually be as the principal on a tele telecommunication, like a face, like a Skype type thing, and I'm there. I read off everything that I have. If there's any witnesses, the witnesses are called there. Usually, we try and keep that to adults, right, because of the 
whole issue of other students, you know, they might have documented something, but I won't bring them to that teleconference. And, and many times I won't even reveal their name. I'll just tell them, if, if you tell me everything that happened, then I'll tell the aggressor that we caught it on a video camera, you know. Tell me where it was. We have 168 cameras. I can find where that was, but I need the time and place, and then that way you won't be looked at as a snitch. So we want to, um, you know, in, let the hearing officer decide what it's going to turn into, and then the hearing officer will look to see if there were past infractions and take that into consideration and issue up to a 45-day suspension um, where the student is entitled to come to school two hours a day, in our case in the afternoon, to do that type of makeup work. But then we also, all the things that we talked about today, what's, what are the root issues of this? Because almost always the bully has been bullied, whether it's been by someone in their family or someone else. What is the root of that? So it's not just a punitive thing. We also want, of course, help the victim, but we also want to try and see what kind of support we can have for the bully. And then when they come back from this suspension, then to have a plan um, and to make sure that there's regular check-ins and, and monitoring of that student because we want them to re-enter the community in a way where we're accepting them with open arms but with some stipulations in terms of you know where they're allowed to go and what and so that they understand clearly what the um, expectations are okay our time it's also is critical to loop in law enforcement at, at some point law enforcement when you're to the point where it's significant severe and unremitting and unresponsive, uh, have an officer in, get an incident number, see what they're going to do to follow up. If it's just a visit to the house, sometimes that gets the message across. But once you have that incident number, then you can attach everything not only to um, your documentation, but to a legal framework. And, you know, there are, there are cases so severe I haven't had one but uh, there's a there's a legal threshold for a restraining order there's a legal threshold for harassment these are all things that um, if you start to let them know because sometimes five days off of school who cares you know it just gives you more time to sit on Facebook and say nasty things about this person um, so if you if you loop in law enforcement it also is a is a good next step okay thank you very much And thank you for participating in our colloquium. Okay. Have a good day.